In order to adequately address the question of birth and migration, we must first engage in a reflection on the fundamental right of children to be conceived and born to parents who find themselves in situations of either forced or voluntary migration. While pursuing answers to such a fundamental question, we quickly find the current day obstacles that are placed to creation of new life in the world at large and are exacerbated by the repressive policies of some governments and extremist groups that impose forced sterilization, contraception, and abortion on migrants and refugees under their control or influence. Once a child has been born to migrant or refugee families already living temporarily or permanently in a host country, she or he is at risk of remaining stateless unless the host authorities concede nationality or even more importantly citizenship through use solely. This right is more and more contested by the citizenry of receiving countries who are affected by attitudes of xenophobia, discrimination, and outright rejection towards strangers and newcomers. This paper will attempt to examine within the limitations of space and time, although I did submit a longer written uh, paper, these crucial questions underlying the challenge, challenging topic of birth and migration. While approaching this reflection, I will rely on internationally agreed human rights principles and policies and on the tenets and doctrine of the Magisterium of the Catholic Church which tragically stand in stark contrast to the real-life situation of countless present-day migrants, refugees, asylum speaker, seekers, and victim survivors of human trafficking and modern forms of slavery. First of all, the right to be born. The Catechism of the Catholic Church unequivocally posits the right to life of every human person as follows. Human life must be respected and protected absolutely from the moment of conception. From the first moment of his existence, a human being must be recognized as having the rights of a person, among which the inviolable right of every innocent being to life. Through its international covenant on civil and political rights, the international community codified in secular terms the right to life that already had been recognized by people of faith from time immemorial, I quote, every human being has the inherent, inherent right to life. This right shall be protected by law. No one shall be arbitrarily deprived of his life, end of quote. Even a cursory survey of the situation faced by many people on the move in the world of today, particularly among forced migrants, however, gives striking evidence that the right to be conceived and born is not always respected in the spirit of religious teaching or of international policy. In a 2013 report entitled Depo Provera, Deadly Reproductive Violence Against Women, the Rebecca Project for Justice revealed a policy of the Israeli government to mandate Depo Provera injections for Ethiopian Jewish women refugees who sought resettlement in Israel. According to the Rebecca Project report, women were subjected to these injections without being fully informed of the potentially harmful effects of this medication. Even more recently, however, we see similar attempts to control population growth among the refugee population of the Rohingyas who have fled Myanmar in massive numbers to escape what some experts have labeled genocidal persecution. At the end of May 2018, the Bangladesh government announced a plan in cooperation with the United Nations Fund for Population Activities, UNFPA, to provide so-called reproductive health and family planning information and services to the Rohingya refugees and host communities in Cox's Bazaar district without discrimination uh, and, and with dignity and respect, so they said. Mr. Kazi Mustafa Sarwar, chief of the Bangladesh Family Planning Directorate, insistently stated to a local journal journalist, I quote, many of them have given short -term, been given short-acting injectable contraceptives with three months effectiveness, but we want to introduce long-acting methods that last three years and 10 years. A major obstacle, another major obstacle to being born to refugee or migrant parents is the promotion of abortion among these populations. 
The Holy See dedicated urgent attention and reflection on such practices when in 1999 the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees in collaboration with the World Health Organization and UNFPA and some NGOs published the Interagency Field Manual on Reproductive Health in Refugee Situations. This reflection led to the preparation of a note prepared by three Holy See dicasteries, uh, then existing pastoral councils for health pastoral care, for the pastoral care of migrants, and for the family, for dissemination to the Catholic bishops' conferences of the world. The overall goals of the note were described as follows. I quote, this interdicasterial note takes the field manual as a pastoral challenge for the church and calls both pastors and other pastoral workers involved in the areas of family, health care, migrants, and itinerant people to vigilance so that the love, respect, and protection of refugees and their rights, amid, among which the inalienable right to life, may be the underlying and driving motive of their action for the improvement of the conditions of life of millions of displaced persons and refugees and their enjoyment of the protection of their life and health." End of quote. With much regret, we must acknowledge that the Holy See's concerns fell on many inattentive or rejecting ear ears. In fact, during 2013, the United Nations constituted a commission of inquiry on human rights in the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, North Korea, and released its report to the UN Council on Human Rights on 17 February 2014, finding that, I quote, systematic, widespread, and gross human rights violations have been and are being committed by the Democratic People's Republic of Korea and that in the light of the gravity, scale, and level of organization of these violations, the Council concludes that crimes against humanity have been committed by officials of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, pursuant to policies established at the highest level of the state. Repatriated women who are pregnant are subjected to forced abortions, and babies born to repatriated women are often killed. These practices are driven by racist attitudes toward interracial children of Koreans and the intent to punish further women who have left the country and their assumed contact with Chinese men, end of quote. The report also mentioned China's complicity in these crimes. I quote, Despite the gross human rights violations awaiting repatriated persons, China pursues a rigorous policy of forcibly repatriating citizens of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea who cross the border illegally." End of quote. Let us pray that the world leaders and policymakers will heed the forceful and persistent promotion of respect for the value of all human life from conception to natural death that is constantly by, reiterated by Pope Francis. I quote, human life is sacred and inviolable. Every civil right rests on the recognition of the first and most fundamental right, that of life, which is not subordinate to any condition, be it quantitative, economic, or least of all, ideological, end of quote. The right to national identity and citizenship. Despite the severe challenges in their very, to their very right to be born, more and more refugee and migrant children are present in all parts of the world. UNICEF reports the following uh, statistics in this regard. 31 million children live outside their country of birth, including 11 million child refugees and asylum seekers. Nearly one in three children living outside their country of birth is a refugee. For adults, the proportion under UNHCR's mandate is less than 1 in 20. Nearly 1 in every 200 children in the world is a child refugee. Between 2005 and 2015, the number of child refugees under UNHCR's mandate more than doubled. During the same period, the total number of all child migrants rose by 21%. One in every 70 children worldwide lives outside his or her country of origin. By the end of 2015, some 41 million people were displaced by violence and conflict within their own countries, and an estimated 17 million of them were children. Some 70,000 children are born stateless every year, 
often as the result of migration undertaken by their parents. In its report, UNICEF notes further that, I quote, without a legal identity or the right to one, children can be denied essential services, including health care, social protection, and education. They may be restricted in their future movements or unable or unwilling to seek protection when they need it. In the case of statelessness, these problems can be passed from generation to generation. Parents without legal identities are frequently unable to obtain them for their children. In the course of primary research uh, initiative targeting Syrian refugees in Jordan, my own organization, the International Catholic Migration Commission, found that the child's birth certificate serves as a crucial identity document since it is required to prove parentage, re register children in school, as well as to register the children in the family uh, for an asylum seeker certificate to get more assistance. At the same time, ICMC also found that in practice, this document is more often prioritized by women than men. In situations where a family is missing several pieces of documentation, the birth certificate of the children is most often the biggest concern of the mothers who link it with the child's future. One way to solve the dilemma of children born outside the country of origin of their parents is to grant them citizenship in the country of their birth. One expert makes, uh, offers the following conclusion. Use solely prevents persons born and raised in a state from remaining foreign nationals with limited rights to residence and political participation. Use solely citizenship has the advantage of offering membership of a given political community to those most likely to live there to be subject to its laws, and to contribute to its society and the economy. It provides a way of promoting social integration and democratic legitimacy, and reducing concerns about internal, external, internal exclusion and insecurity of residents. To the chagrin of some political leaders attempting to limit use solely concessions, Pope Francis prophetically addressed this issue in his message for the 2018 World Day of Migrants and Refugees. I quote, the International Convention on the Rights of the Child provides a universal legal basis for the protection of underage migrants. The universal right to a nationality should be recognized and duly certified for all children at birth. The statelessness which migrants and refugees sometimes fall into can be easily avoided with the adoption of nationality legislation that is conformity in conformity with the fundamental principles of international law. The right to full life and dignity for migrant children, including the rights to access to health care, education, and social protection. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights proclaimed that, I quote, everyone has the right to a standard of living adequate for the health and well-being of himself and of his family, including food, clothing, housing, and medical care, and necessary social services, and the right to security in the event of unemployment, sickness, disability, widowhood, old age, or other lack of livelihood in circumstances beyond his control. These fundamental rights should apply to all persons, regardless of migratory status. The reality is, however, that the opportunity for such access by refugee and migrant children varies greatly and to a large extent depends on both national policy and practice on such issues as family reunification, services such as health and education, and social inclusion. Pope Francis links the child's access to basic services to the guarantees assured in the International Convention on the Rights of the Child, which, I quote, he says, provides a universal legal basis for the protection of underage migrants. They must be spared of any form of detention related to migratory status and must be guaranteed regular access to primary and secondary education. Equally, when they come of age, they must be guaranteed the right to remain and to enjoy the possibility of continuing their studies. Thus, the Vatican's 20 points document, which was a document prepared for advocacy around the two international compacts presently being uh, negotiated at the United Nations, one for refugees and one for safe, regular, and orderly migration, uh, contains uh, these, uh, these uh, recommendations. 
encourage states to adopt national policies that provide equal access to education for migrant, asylum seeker, and refugee learners at all levels. For example, enact national or regional policies which provide migrants and refugees with access to primary and secondary education level, no matter their, their migratory status and enact policies which provide that the primary and secondary education to which migrants and refugees have access meets the same standards of education received by citizens. In conclusion, three fundamental rights are essential pillars for the survival and future growth of children born to families affected by migration. The right to be born or the right to life, the right to national identity and citizenship, and the right to full life and dignity with access to basic health care, education, and social protection. These are preconditions to assure early survival, growth to physical, emotional, and spiritual maturity, as well as productive and responsible engagement with and contributions to the host society. In his message for World Day of Peace 2018, Pope Francis envisioned the roadmap to converting the hopes and dreams of migrant and refugee children and of their parents and family members to achievable reality. I quote, in a spirit of compassion, let us embrace all those fleeing from war and hunger or forced by discrimination, persecution, poverty, and environmental degradation to leave their homelands. We know that it is not enough to open our hearts to the suffering of others. Much more remains to be done before our brothers and sisters can once again live peacefully in a safe home. Welcoming others requires concrete commitment, a network of assistance and goodwill, vigilant and sympathetic attention, the responsible management of new and complex situations that at times compound numerous existing problems, to say nothing of resources, which are always limited. By practicing the virtue of prudence, government leaders should take practical measures to welcome, promote, protect, integrate, and within the limits allowed by a correct understanding of the common good to permit them to become part of a new society. Thank you.